Welcome to Tax Notes Talk, a podcast from Tax Notes, the leading source of tax news, information, and analysis. Welcome to the podcast. I'm David Stewart, Editor-in-Chief of Tax Notes Today International. This week, the very model of a modern major milestone. On February 9th, the U.S. Tax Court released its long-awaited transfer pricing decision in 3M versus Commissioner. The case, which had been pending in the tax court since 2013, was yet another win for the IRS after what had been a long streak of losses. But the importance of the decision goes beyond 3M. To tell us more about what the court decided and what it means for transfer pricing litigation is Tax Notes contributing editor Ryan Finley. Ryan, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks for having me. What are the basics of this 3M case? What is it about? So the 3M case is about a a very specific set of regulations called the blocked income regulations. Um, And they're part of the transfer pricing regulations under Section 482 more generally. But they basically set the conditions under which the IRS will respect the effect of a foreign law that blocks a payment or receipt of an arm's length amount. So ordinarily, you'd have to pay an arm's length amount in a control transaction under the transfer pricing regs. But these regulations basically set out the requirements under which the IRS will accept that, okay, you, you cannot, you are not legally able to make that payment. Okay, so in, in what sort of cases would you not be legally able to make the payment? The specific uh, restriction at issue here is Brazil's former regime of maximum on uh, the royalty rate that a local subsidiary could pay a uh, foreign controlling parent. They were essentially written into the tax law, but as a matter of unwritten practice, they were picked up by the Brazilian Patent and Trademark Office and the Brazilian Central Bank. And between the two, the rules prevented the payment of the royalties that the parties stipulated in 3M would have been arm's length. So about how much money are we talking about here? We're looking at about $24 million. All right. Now, this has been going on for quite a while. What all has been happening? Well, yes, that's a question that that many have raised, especially since uh, November 2016, which is when the case was fully argued and briefed. There isn't really any clear answer as to why it took six and a half years to get an opinion in this case. I would say that it was was fully, it was reviewed by uh, 16 other tax court judges and there were two concurring opinions and three dissenting opinions. That may have made it take a little bit longer than usual, but the extent of the delay is, to my knowledge, unexplained. All right, well, then let's get into what they actually decided. So you're you're mentioning this this isn't a unanimous decision, but how did the majority come out? The opinion was written by Judge Richard Morrison. Six other tax court judges joined that opinion. Two concurred in the result only, and eight joined one or more of the three dissents. So it was nine to eight in terms of the outcome, but only seven signed on to the controlling opinion. So it wasn't really a majority. Okay, this is this is fairly confusing, but I'll, I'll trust you to, to sort through uh, which ones are most important. So in the controlling decision, how did they come out? So, right, the main, the main issue, whether 3M actually satisfied these regulations, you know, was in most cases stipulated. It was really about the validity of these regs, Uh, There's the sort of substantive validity under Chevron and the procedural validity under the Administrative Procedure Act. The court ultimately upheld the validity of the regulations under both. In terms of the Chevron analysis, um, the question is really whether a 1972 Supreme Court decision, First Security Bank of Utah v. Commissioner, was controlling precedent in terms of the meaning of Section 482 and whether that basically dictated the outcome. The court held that it was not because that case was decided on the basis of an old regulatory provision. Uh, It wasn't enforced during the tax years at issue and an older version of the statute that didn't have the commensurate with income standard added in 1986. So basically, the, the court held that under Chevron, these regulations were a reasonable way to implement the, the sort of tax parity policy of the first section of four, Section 482, and also independently a reasonable interpretation of the commensurate with income standard in the second sentence. In terms of the Administrative Procedure Act, the controlling opinion basically says that the, the policy behind it is self-evident by the text of the, of the regulation, and because there you know, was a, a satisfactory notice and comment period and 
you know, the IRS uh, heard the objections of taxpayers, but went forward with the regulation anyway, that it was more or less clear why they were doing it and that they rejected the comments sort of objecting to these regulations when they were issued in 94. Okay, before we continue on with this case, I do want to ask about the, the commensurate with income idea. Where does it come from and, and how has it been interpreted until now? Yeah, so this is a good question. And I think it it, it played an unexpectedly critical role in uh, the tax court's opinion, um, and particularly in the concurring opinions. Uh, before the Tax Reform Act in 1986, there was only one section to Section 482. In 1986, they added this sentence that says, and it's kind of awkwardly worded, but it, it says, the income attributable to a transfer or license of a tangible property shall be commensurate with the income attributable to the intangible. Interpreting this, this sentence um, and its significance, uh, it's been a major point of contention and a major point of, I would say, uncertainty in the case law for decades now. Some basically argue that it really doesn't, didn't do anything except elucidate the arm's length standard and how it applies to intangibles. Some think it only uh, was meant to authorize sort of periodic adjustments to the transfer price for intangibles. Some judges, including those who joined Morrison's opinion and the two concurrences, think the commensurate with income standard is sort of a broader provision meant to kind of draw in more kind of economic concepts and less focused on, you know, specific comparables. The relevance in this case was that the, the allegedly blocked income was an arm's length royalty for the license of intangible property. So it's not the normal uh, situation in which this is, arises, which usually comes up when you're dealing with transfer pricing methods. Um, it came up in the Altera v. Commissioner case. But this was sort of a, an application of that provision that I don't think a lot of people expected. So it was this commensurate with income idea that brought the, the concurring opinions along? Yeah, that's right. Even though it was independently uh, cited as sort of statutory authorization in the controlling opinion, the commensurate with income standard was the focus of the, the two concurrences written by Judges Kathleen Kerrigan and Elizabeth Copeland. And uh, Copeland's in particular was fairly striking in that it said that you don't even need these regulations in place to get to the same result, that the text of the commensurate with income sentence by itself uh, dictates the outcome and, and would require disregarding this Brazilian uh, royalty rate cap. Support for this podcast is provided by the University of California Irvine School of Law Graduate Tax Program. This preeminent and innovative program prepares students to practice tax law at the highest level in the U.S. and abroad. Featuring a low student-faculty ratio, cutting-edge technology instruction, and dedicated career support, UCI's Graduate Tax Program helps prepare students for a future in tax law. Program graduates are placed in top tax-related industries, practicing law in many major U.S. cities. Applications are open now. For more information and to apply to this highly selective program, visit law.uci.edu slash gradtax. That's law.uci.edu slash gradtax. All right, so as I understand it to this point, we have the, the main opinion which says that these regs are valid. You have concurring opinions that say the commensurate with income standard allows this. So where did the dissenting opinions come down? Well, one of the t dissents written by Judge Ronald Buke, and uh, I apologize if I mispronounce that, is basically arguing that this commensurate with income amendment is irrelevant, that it was basically added to address entirely different policy concerns and really has no bearing on the, on the blocked income issue, and consequently that the first Security Bank of Utah decision remains controlling precedent. In another dissent, Judge Carrie Pugh uh, argued that this first, first Security Bank opinion rested on the sort of the definition of income in general, and therefore um, that nothing, you know, no amendment to Section 482 could overturn it. And Judge Amin Toro, he basically focused on the, the Administrative Procedure Act and what he believed uh, was a complete failure in the preamble to the 1994 regulations and to the 1993 temporary regulations to in any way explain the basis for these rules and to you know basically 
rebut comments that argued that the regulations violated First Security Bank. Now, on a, on a previous episode, which we'll link to in the show notes, you were here talking about the Coca-Cola decision and how there is some relationship between that and this 3M case. Uh, could you tell us about that? Sure. There's a very direct connection. In the tax court's 2020 opinion uh, in the Coca-Cola case, um, they explicitly reserved ruling on a similar blocked income issue because the opinion noted that 3M was pending and therefore that the, the court wasn't going to rule on that issue there. Sure, shortly after the, the uh, 3M opinion came out, though, Judge Albert Lauber, who's presiding over the, the Coca-Cola case, issued a, an order for supplemental briefing, and um, that presumably will lead to a, a supplemental opinion on, among other things, on how 3M will apply to the Coca-Cola case and the blocked income issue that arose there. Now, does this look like it works to the favor of the IRS in that case as well? Well, yes, it does. Now, I would note that the controlling opinion does not assess every condition under the blocked income regulations. It only assesses, depending on how you count them, essentially three, which are the requirements that the restriction apply generally to all comparably situated taxpayers, that it affect controlled and uncontrolled taxpayers alike, and that it be publicly promulgated. And it was the failure to meet those three requirements, which the court, the tax court upheld as valid, that decided the case in 3M. There are two other requirements. One in particular is important. It's the requirement that the taxpayer cannot make an arm's length payment in any form, such as, you know, in the form of a dividend. The validity of that was not specifically examined in 3M, and that could come up in subsequent cases, including in Coca-Cola. Having said that, it, it was it's certainly a win for the IRS that the parts of the regulations that were assessed were upheld. But given the narrow margin of victory, given the uh, obviously wide diversity of views on the issue, I think we're only in the uh, sort of early days of how this issue is really going to be decided. So what are the broader implications of this decision? Well, a lot of taxpayers have encountered this issue uh, with blocked income in Brazil, specifically royalty income. However, uh, Brazil's passed a number of reforms to their tax laws over the past couple of uh, years, including a, a, a provisional measure at the very end of 2022 that adopts essentially OECD-aligned transfer pricing rules. So the specific blocked income issue that came up in this case should not arise in the future. But Obviously, there, are, there could always be other situations where a blocked income situation arises. And I think more than anything, it's the, the broader interpretation of the commensurate with income amendment and you know, its application to an area that maybe wasn't immediately obvious or evident to many people that it'll probably be the broadest sort of consequence of 3M, assuming it's upheld, which it very well may not be. Well, that does bring me to my last question, which is that, you know, we, we have this you know, closely divided court decision here. Even though we've spent six years waiting for this opinion, do you expect that this will drag out longer through an appeals process? I think that is a very safe assumption. And there will probably be multiple appeals, actually. 3M would be appealed to the Eighth Circuit. And Coca-Cola, assuming that the 3M opinion is applied in a way that hands the IRS a, a victory on the blocked income issue in that case, Coca-Cola would likely include that in its appeal to the 11th Circuit. So you very well could have, and, and in my opinion, probably will have two appeals of the blocked income regulations that will take place over the next uh, year or so. And how the appeals court judges will see the issue is um, really hard to predict. Obviously, it's not, it's not something that's seen as a, an easy question to answer, at least by the 17 tax court judges who were involved in the case. Well, all right. Well, well, thank you for taking us through this thicket of transfer pricing decision, and I'm sure we'll have you back to talk about the appeals. Sounds good. And now, coming attractions. Each week, we highlight new and interesting commentary in our magazines. Joining me now is Executive Editor for Commentary, Jasper Smith. Jasper, what will you have for us? Thanks, Dave. In Tax Notes Federal, Richard Molina and Bruce McLean examine the history of Section 7491, enacted to help taxpayers shift the burden of proof to the government 
and question whether it has achieved its purpose. Three Foley and Lardner practitioners discuss redemption issues with qualified small business stock and how to avoid the founder stock problem. In Tax Note State, three Grant Thornton practitioners discuss how taxpayers may use recently released state guidance to help determine the indirect tax treatment of NFTs in states without specific guidance. Timothy Noonan and Catherine Piazza McDonald provide some guidance on how to make the move to lower tax states. In Tax Notes International, Nana Amasarfo reviews comments to the OECD's public consultation on Pillar 1's provisions on digital services taxes and notes the differing opinions on what will be most destabilizing to the international tax system. Oliver Tradler examines the transfer pricing consequences of the U.S. Tax Court's 2022 Medtronic II decision. In featured analysis, Ryan Finley explains that the IRS's win in 3M may be a sign that the courts are paying closer attention to Section 482's commensurate with income standard. And finally, on the opinions page, Carrie Brandon Elliott examines comments submitted in response to recent IRS guidance on the corporate AMT. That's it for this week. You can follow me online at tax stew, that's S-T-E-W, and be sure to follow at Tax Notes for all things tax. If you have any comments, questions, or suggestions for a future episode, you can email us at podcast at taxanalyst.org. And as always, if you like what we're doing here, please leave a rating or review wherever you download this podcast. We'll be back next week with another episode of Tax Notes Talk. Tax Notes Talk is a production of Tax Notes. You can learn more about us by visiting www.taxnotes.com slash podcast. When major media wants the straight story, they turn to Tax Notes. Thank you for listening and join us again for another edition of Tax Notes Talk. Want to see more like this? Subscribe for more tax videos. Special thanks to our executive producers, Jasper Smith and Paige Jones, as well as showrunner and audio engineer, Jordan Parrish.